Hello writers, come write with me. My name is Michaela Greenwood. I create worlds for mind adventures. Welcome to my YouTube channel, Write with Michaela. Don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the bell so you can go on this journey with me. Today we are reading my chapter six. If you're writing with me and you wish to exchange chapters, then I need written permission to read your chapter on the channel along with your name or pen name and age. I also need permission from your parent or legal guardian if you are under 18 years of age. If you're under 18 years old and have guardian permission, then I will need a pen name to read your material. Writers may send their chapters in PDF or Word document format to writewithmikella at gmail.com. That's W-R-I-T-E-W-I-T-H M-Y-K-E-L-A at gmail.com. No Google Docs, please. I'm not making any promises to read every chapter sent to me on the channel, but I intend to read all the chapters sent. Once I start reading chapters from others, those videos will be the second video on Friday. All chapters read on Fridays, whether they are mine or or another writer's work are copyright protected material and no one may use any part in writing their own stories. Now before we go further, farther, I will remind everyone that this story is at least PG-13. Also, this story is in its rough draft stage and needs many more passes of edits. But we are reading what I have together. Some of the things we've discussed on Tuesdays, like the senses, will help me edit. If you've listened to the story so far, you know that I have campfires. But if I were filling out those scenes, you might hear the campfire pop or crackle. You might see the orange, yellows, reds, and blues of the fire. You might smell the smoke. I will have to decide how much eye candy I will give my readers as I do each edit pass through. I don't want to bog down the story too much, but I do want to stimulate my reader senses. In the last chapter, we read about spider mounds. And while we may not have ever seen or heard about spider mounds in real life, it wasn't long before we read that magic could have made those spiders. We still don't totally know why Kirsha magically created spiders or that Kirsha's magic was actually responsible for the spiders. Now, let's dive into Chapter 6, The Interference of the Past. At the end of their sixth day of traveling, Kirian, Kirsha, and Kilti came to the split of two rivers. The port was still further west. It was just north of the mouth of the rivers, Lingenis and Essen. The two rivers shared a mouth. After about 30 treks from the ocean, the rivers split apart. Tomorrow, they would travel west to the ocean and cross the rivers. There on the bridge, just outside the port. Kirsha helped Kilty take care of her wound, but she reminded herself not to do too much. She wanted Kilty to learn how to care for the wound herself, especially since Kilty would have the wound for the rest of her life. Afterwards, Kirsha showed Kilty all the different leaves and how to match them. She gave Kilty her apron and then she went to the edge of the river to wade in the water up to her ankles. After she splashed around a bit, she sat down at the edge. She didn't care if she got her dress wet at all. She wanted to cool off. A bath would be really nice, but she knew she couldn't do that out here with Kirian to watch her. She hugged her knees to herself and thought of Kilty. She felt badly for Kilty. She wondered how she would feel if someone had told her that she would have a wound for the rest of her life. Kirsha said a silent prayer to the awesome to let Kilty live the 10 years or so, so she, Kirsha, could have the time she needed to find the city of the ancients and to find Kilty's cure. Kirian watched her and he watched Kilty. He wasn't worried about Kilty mixing up the herbs. He knew Kirsha would check Kilty's work as if she were grading a test. When Kirsha graded Kilty, Kilty would more realize the importance of getting it right. 
and Kilty would only get a hundred if she was as precise as Kirsha. After Kilty separated all the new leaves into the different pockets, she crawled quietly over to Kirian. Dad, she said desperately, I want to see you play with Mom. I want to see you happy. If you were happy, I could be happy. Even with a bad leg for the rest of my life, I could be happy. Kirian smiled gently at Kir Kilty. He realized that Kilty understood that her leg would not get better. Yet, here all she worried about was Kirsha's and his happiness. What do you suggest? Splash her, said Kilty as she giggled behind her hand. She's already wet, so she can't get mad. Kirian looked over to Kirsha. He looked back at Kilty and winked at her. He got up ever so quietly and crept, crept towards the river's edge a little farther down the river from Kirsha. If he got to the river's edge, he could splash Kirsha, even if she started to run away. As he got closer, he noticed she had undone her long braid and she had her hair draped over her shoulders and over her face. She was slightly rocking back and forth. Kirian felt like Kirsha was crying. He wanted to ask her why, but then he looked back at Kilty, who, was, who watched expectantly and eagerly. Kirian slipped his hand silently in the water. Quickly, he splashed Kirsha once, then twice. On the third splash, Kirsha was looking up as she was pushing her hair out of her face. She stared bewildered at Kirian for a few minutes. He was squatting at the edge of the river, and he was smiling broadly as he splashed her. Kirsha just bent her head back down to her knees and continued crying. Kirian splashed her a few more times before he realized that she wasn't ducking away from the water. He walked over to her and sat in the water next to her. He wrapped his arm around her and asked, What's wrong, sweetie? Kirsha got up and turned out of his arms. Please just leave me alone. Kirian stood quickly in her path. He brushed the hair out of her face. No, I can't do that anymore. Tell me why you are crying and tell me why you refuse to play. Kirian, Kirsha, Kirsha sighed deeply. Why are you doing this? I have no choice but to be with you. And things were fine until Kilty opened her mouth. They argued for several minutes. Even when Kirian mentioned Kilty's happiness, that didn't stop the argument. Kirian was getting frustrated with how hard Kirsha was pushing him away. He knew once they went back to the village, they had to get along to continue to live together. In the back of his mind, he thought it would be better to get past everything out here where no one would overhear anything. Kirian was also out of patience. He said with a raised voice, Kilty threatened no one, and I wanted to talk to you originally about why you were crying, but you changed the subject. Since you changed the subject, I'll discuss our new topic. Things have never been fine. Not for you, Kilty, or me. None of us have been happy. We just live each day in silence. I live with you, but you push me away. There's an invisible wall between us. He motioned with his hands and continued speaking urgently. I want to be with you, yet you say we are together. No, we are not together. I cannot live the rest of my life like this. Then tell Mr. Verkoff, argued Kirsha. Don't tell me. I am happy. At least I was. Our lives are just fine. The only problem I see is that you won't work. You're too lazy to work. Kirsha, this has nothing to do with whether or not I work and bring in money, stated Kirian, frustrated. Kirian calmed himself as he realized arguing was just escalating things. He slid his hands down to Kirsha's. He pulled her hands gently to his lips and kissed them. Kirsha tried to pull away. Why are you doing this? And Kilty is watching. We cannot do this in front of her. I can kiss you in front of her. She, after all, knows... That's how we should be acting. You're the one that doesn't know. Kirsha pulled harder and her tears flooded through her. Please leave me alone. 
I will agree to that today if you tell me why you were crying, replied Kirian. Kisha turned her head down. Kirian released her hands as she brought them up to her face. After a few minutes, she brushed the hair out of her face. I was... She looked down again. I, I was thinking of how I would feel if I had an injury that would last the rest of my life. And I was... Oh, Kirsha, I'm so sorry, said Kirian. He gently wrapped his arms around her. She pushed against him. Shh, just cry, okay? That's all. You just cry. And get my shirt as wet as your skirt. He stroked her hair. I didn't know that Kilty's injury bothered you so much. It bothers me too. So you could cry for both of us, and I'll hold both of us up. She pushed some more. No, Kirian, I want to be left alone. She pushed even harder as she looked into Kirian's eyes. No, actually what I want is to find Kilty's cure. No matter what it takes, I want to find her cure. I mean, she's just a child, and we were supposed to protect her, but we didn't. This is our fault. We had to find her cure. I don't care if I die trying. Kirian pushed her hair back. He looked into her face. Her tears glistened in the moonlight. He smiled gently at her. Kirsha, you have a lot of love in you to share. Why don't you tell Kilty how you feel? No, because I don't think she realizes her condition is permanent, replied Kirsha somber, som solemnly. She knows, stated Kirian. I told you she said she could be happy with a bad leg for the rest of her life if we were happy. It wasn't a threat. It was honesty. She cares more for our happiness than she does herself. Kirsha looked down. Kirian gently lifted her chin and bent to kiss her. Kirsha turned her head down again, and Kirian's kiss landed on her forehead. Kirian lifted her chin again. Let us be together, not just for Kilty, but for us. Kirsha pushed his hand down. Kirian, I cannot give you what you want. Ask Mr. Volkov for a different arrangement. I will take Kilty with me to find the cure. You can tell the village what you will. Tell them that Kil Kilty isn't your daughter. I don't care, but I'm finding Kilty's cure. Kirsha walked past Kirian to her blanket. Kirian turned around and realized that Kilty had watched everything. Kilty watched Kirian return with wide eyes. Kirin realized when he got closer that Kilty was on the verge of crying. He grew frustrated. He didn't know how to handle all this crying, so he just plopped down on his blanket. Well, asked Kilty impatiently, what happened? Why did you kiss her on the top of her head like she's a child? Why didn't you kiss her? Kirsha set up. Kilty, that is more than enough. I am not going to listen to another word. Kilty, said Kirin softly. Kirsha is worried about you. She doesn't believe that you know that your leg will hurt for the rest of your life, and... I do know, pleaded Kilty. Dr. Highhand said I might live ten years or I might die tomorrow. He said there was no cure. Right, agreed Kirian. There is no cure. So Kirsha is worried sick about you. That's why I kissed her head, to tell her I understand how she feels. Life isn't all fun and games. I, as a man, will kiss Kirsha differently depending on what I want to tell her. You most certainly will not, start, stated Kirsha. That was the first and last kiss ever. You are going to tell Mr. Volkov to get you a new wife. But, but, cried Kilty. Kirian felt like crying himself. He couldn't understand why Kirsha pushed him away, especially when he knew without a doubt that she loved Kilty and him. And he knew he wouldn't understand until Kirsha would talk to him. Yes, Kirsha, but right now we are sleeping and tomorrow we are walking to the port and then we are going to find the cave. So go to sleep. You too, Kilty, go to sleep. Kilty obediently lay down. She was scared. She didn't want Kirsha to leave them. She knew 
She would try everything she could to get them to love each other. Kirsha lay down. She wondered if the awesome heard her prayers and if he saw her tears. She thought if he had, then it would rain. And she desperately wished for the rain as she cried herself to sleep. In the early morning, Kirsha awoke to a light mist falling on her face. At first, she thought Kirin was splashing her again. But then she realized that it was just the aftermath of a heavy rain that everything was soaking. She immediately remembered Kilty's wound, but she didn't know how to dry the wound when everything was wet. Kirsha sat up and saw Kirian leaning over Kilty. She couldn't actually see Kirian because he used his blanket over himself to act as a tent over Kilty. Kirsha went over. I could have done that, you know. Kirian peeked out from under the blanket. I know, but I can do such things too. Dr. Highhands showed both of us how to change the bandage. Kirian ducked back under the blanket and finished. Then he flipped off his blanket and rolled it up. I'm concerned about Kilty too, he stated. I didn't say you weren't, replied Kirsha. I'm going to take care of her. You aren't bringing her to the inner forest or the city of the ancients. I'm keeping her safe while you find the cure. What? asked Kirsha. I would prefer to leave both of you safely at home, but I know you would never stay, so I will. I will stay and I'll wait for your return. When you return, we can get married for real. What? asked Kirsha again. I told you I'm not getting married. Find someone else. No, I want you and no one else, stated Kirian sternly. Now let's go. He lifted Kilty up and gently set her in the small pull cart. He turned and headed west along the river's edge. Kirsha built up fear in herself. Kirian had never been aggressive towards her. She had felt like she could act normally around him, but now she knew that she would have to stay guarded. She worried as she walked slowly along behind Kirian and Kilty. They walked until well past dark. It was nearing midnight when they finally came to the bridge and the ocean. Kirian declared that they would sleep on this side of the rivers, so Kirsha replied that she was going to wade in the waves of the ocean. Kirsha wanted Kilty to come along with her, but Kirian protested, Kil Kilty getting her wound wet, especially after all the rain from last night. Then Kirian told Kirsha not to stay out too long because the spikus flecuses would be out soon. And he added that he didn't need two injured females to deal with. Kirsha rolled her eyes. She gathered up her dress and waited out. She mumbled under her breath, men. I don't need two helpless females to care for. Ha! Like he does, he really does that much for Kilty and me. Her leg passed by some seaweed. She screamed and jumped. She shot out of the water. Her heart raced and her breathing was heavy. Kirian hurried over. Are you okay? Kirsha's heart was still racing. So she yelled at Kirian for scaring her and told him it was his fault. Kirian didn't understand how it could be his fault. So Kirsha told him that something passed by her leg and her mind told her spicus flecuses. Then she reiterated that Kirian scared her. She showed Kirian her leg and asked if he saw any marks. Then she walked back to her blanket. Kirian chuckled. I didn't mean to scare you, he called. I just didn't want you to throw all caution in the river while you played in the ocean. He laughed and walked to his blanket. I'm glad you're okay, he said, trying to comfort her. Okay, she said, irritated. Do you think being scared witless is okay? Would you two stop fighting? yelled Kilty. I hated the silence, but I hate the fighting even more. Kilty, we are not fighting, stated Kirsha. If we were fighting, Kirian would be yelling too. Is he yelling? No, he's laughing at me, at us, at females, because we're oh so delicate. She rolled her eyes and lay down to sleep. It's not my fault that a little piece of seaweed made you fly out of the water. 
laughed Kirian. But now that I know you're not hurt, I think it's absolutely hilarious. I wanted a moment of peace. I wanted to relax, said Kirsha mundanely. I didn't remind you of the spikus flicuses to scare you, replied Kirian. You do not give me my due credit. I reminded you of them because I care for you. I, I love you. Kirsha sat straight up and turned toward Kirian. You what? I love you, stated Kirian. He felt tremendously better, like someone had lifted a huge weight off his chest, because now he could breathe easier. He smiled at her. No, you don't, returned Kirsha. Scenes of her adopting parents went through her mind. She knew her father would tell her mother he loved her to calm her down and coax her to let her guard down. Then he would capture her and torture her again. While Kirsha wasn't sure exactly what her father did to her mother, she knew it was some sort of mental torture. Her mother would scream out when he touched her, at least some of the times she did. Other times there was nothing. Kirsha wasn't sure what the difference was. Her statement, her reaction, shocked Kirian and Kilty. Kirian looked at Kirsha. She looked like she would bolt away any moment. Kirsha, I said that I love you because it is true, reasoned Kirian. Why else would I say it? Please, Kirian, don't. Please, Kirsha cried. I beg of you not to do this. Please, you've never acted this way before. Please, let's just find the information we came for. I wanted to help Kilty. I didn't think you would do this. Do what? asked Kirian, confused. I don't understand a word of what you're saying, Kirian started for her. He wanted to comfort her. Kirsha jumped back. I don't want you to touch me. I, I, I don't want... She didn't finish her sentence. How could she explain what her father did to her mother or what Dante started to do to her after he beat her near to death? She remembered the piercing pain in her mind. It was such a blinding pain. And she didn't know that Dante only beat her and that someone else was trying to enter her body. Kirian stopped. He badly wanted to talk to Kirsha about what she meant. He glanced at Kilty. Kilty looked confused and scared. She bit her lip and she trembled. He looked back at Kirsha. She looked like a frightened animal that was ready to bolt. Kirian stepped back and something told him to look for spider mounds. He saw three of them. He glanced over his shoulder to the bridge. He didn't want to cross it without some good light. He wanted to see the wood's condition. He looked back and the spider mounds were shrinking to nothing. Kirsha eased back to her blanket. She didn't take her eyes off Kirian. Kil Kirsha gathered up her blanket and spread it out near Kilty's. Kilty looked between the two. She sensed Kirsha's fear was great, so she too became fearful and afraid. Kirian didn't know what to do because now both females jumped every time he moved. He lay down and replayed the conversation in his mind. He tried remembering the conversations they had had in the past three years, which wasn't too hard since they never talked much, especially not about feelings. Kirian knew that Kirsha always kept some distance between them if possible, even when they shared the same bed. Kirsha would sleep at the very edge and she insisted on separate covers. Kirsha never used a nightdress either. Kirian thought perhaps that Kirsha thought it was too much trouble to change. Now he wondered. He thought, but love is a good thing. I thought she liked me. My love for her should have excited her. What would make her so scared of love? Kirian started drifting into sleep. And what was, what else was she going to say? I need to figure that out. In the morning, when Kirian awoke, Kirsha was washing her face in the river, and Kilty was still asleep. Kirian decided to talk to Kirsha. He quietly walked over. Kirsha turned around and saw him. She looked to the ground and tried to hurry past him. Kirian gripped her arm and pulled her back. Kirsha tried to scream Kilty's name, but Kirian covered her mouth. I'm not going to hurt you. Kirian stated, frustrated. I want to talk to you while Kilty is asleep. 
Kirian wrapped his arms around Kirsha. Kirsha frantically tried to escape his grip. Kirian gripped her shoulders and pushed her down. Sit, he commanded. She sat. She scooted back away from Kirian until she was at the river's edge. She furtively looked over to Kilty's sleeping form. Kirsha, what is wrong with you? What are you so scared of? asked Kirian. I don't want to be hurt. I don't want to be tortured, she replied. Kirian didn't know what Kirsha was afraid of. Torture didn't really make sense to him. So he probed about what could have hurt Kirsha. He started with saying he, was go he wasn't going to leave Kirsha and asked if anyone had abandoned her. He asked if she had been married before. Even though she had been 13 when they met, he knew of girls who married at age 12. Kirsha shook her head no, even though she knew her real parents had abandoned her. Did the man not show up on your wedding day? Is that it? Were you jilted? Continued Kirian. Kirsha again shook her head no. Then she bolted back to the blankets. Kilty, get up! We need to go! Hurry, get up! Kirsha shook Kilty. Kirian felt at odds. He decided not to press the issue any further, at least until Kirsha calmed down some. If she calmed down, then perhaps she would be more reasonable. They were ready to go in no time. Kirian carried Kilty on his shoulders across the bridge that crossed over both rivers. Then he went back across. He and Kirsha pushed and pulled the little car across. Kirsha had calmed greatly. She seemed to be her old self again. She concentrated on finding the cave. She had them start by heading north along the coast. Excuse me. When the coast curved northeast, they would head straight east, inland, 20 treks, and then would angle back out to the shore. They would repeat this until they found the cave, if there was a, if there was a cave. Kirsha said that if they didn't find the cave within 20 treks from the shore, then they would search 20 treks inland to 40 treks inland. Kirian argued it would be easier if we went 40 treks inland to begin with and then head back out. You don't know where the cave is, asked Kilty, as she realized they might not find her cure. At this point, she didn't realize that the cure was in the city of the ancients, and they were only looking for a map here. Well, sweetie, the book said near the northwestern shore, replied Kirsha, but there is a lot of ground out here. But if it's a cave, we should be able to see it from far away, right? Asked Kilty. Not if the cave is underground, which does seem a bit impossible since we are so close to the ocean, answered Kirsha. But perhaps we could see it from far off. Well, I could ride on Dad's shoulders, then I could see far ahead, exclaimed Kilty. No, Kilty, you are too heavy, stated Kirsha. That's too long for him to carry you. I can carry her, stated Kirian. He looked at Kilty. Just so long as you never call me dad again. Okay, replied Kilty. She didn't care, so long as she got to ride on his shoulders. She wanted to help find the cave and her cure. Why do you want to disown her so badly, asked Kirsha. Then a thought hit her. If her real parents didn't want her, then why would her adopting parents want her? She slightly, slightly shook her head to herself. Kirian lifted the little Kilty up. It's not that I want to disown her. It's that I hate what the village thinks of me because they think I'm her father. Here we go with the village again, stated Kirsha. She put her hands on her hips. What does the village think? She was actually glad to think about the village instead of her parents abandoning her and her adopting parents wanting to disown her. Well, one of two things, replied Kirian. Either they think I just got a girl pregnant without marrying her, or they think I left the girl after marriage. Maybe they think your wife died, reasoned Kirsha, as she motioned with her hand. A lot of women die in childbirth, you know? But that's still me getting a girl pregnant, 
argued Kirian. I've never had sex with any girl to even be able to get any girl pregnant. I am honorable. I have honorable intentions. Besides, why else would we need to leave my village if my previous wife had died? What is sex? asked Kilty. It's how parents make babies, replied Kirsha hastily as she glanced up at Kilty. She grabbed the handle to the little cart and headed out. Who cares anyway what the village thinks or in what v which village we live? All the villages are the same. Is that true? Kilty asked Kirian. Yes, that's true, answered Kirian, somewhat relieved that they didn't have to explain the actual sexual act. He started walking behind Kirsha. So, is that why you and Kirsha don't have a baby? Because you didn't make sex? Asked Kilty. That's correct. Kirsha and I have never had sex together, answered Kirian. Has Kirsha made sex with anyone? Kilty asked. Kirsha whirled around. Kilty, that is quite enough. Little girls do not talk about sex. One more word of it will get you a good hard spanking, little girl. Have I made myself clear? Yes, ma'am, replied Kilty quietly. Or I should be, I guess. Yes, ma'am, replied Kilty quietly. I'm sorry. I didn't know. I didn't mean to make you mad at me. Kilty started shaking. Kilty, it's not your fault, comforted Kirian. I should not have talked about such a thing in front of you. Kirian pouted her leg. Do you want a baby? Kilty asked, unable to contain her curiosity. Kirsha whirled around again. Put her down and give me your belt. No, cried Kilty as she wrapped her arms tightly around Kirian's neck. Kirian tried peeling her fingers back so he could breathe. Kirsha, you cannot blame her. It's my fault. But while we're on the subject, do you want a baby? Absolutely not, Kirsha yelled. I do, replied Kirian solemnly. I want us to make a baby together. Why? So I'm dependent on you? Kirsha yelled. I will never be dependent on anyone. I will never trust anyone enough to depend on them. Kirian slid Kilty down and started towards Kirsha. Kirsha turned to run, but she tripped on her dress and fell. Kirian helped her up, up, and he hugged her tightly. Why don't you want a baby? He asked. Have you had a miscarriage? Let me go, Kirsha demanded, as tears streamed down her cheeks. She pounded his chest with her fist. No, this is going to stop right now, replied Kirian. He glanced around and saw spider mounds. He moved both of them away from the swarms heading their way. You're going to tell me what you're so scared of. You're going to tell me why you won't accept my love. And you're going to tell me why you don't want a baby. Kirian gripped her wrist. And while we're about it, we're not going to step in spider mounds. Kirsha pulled against his grip as she glanced around. It's not my fault. I didn't want it to happen. I didn't want to be hurt. I didn't want him to hurt me. I swear. I swear I didn't. Kirsha's tears slipped down her face. Tell me how you were hurt, demanded Kirian. Tell me what you think I'm going to do to hurt you now. Kirsha looked past Kirian at Kilty. Kilty was staring intently at them. Kirian looked over his shoulders. Kilty, get Kirsha some flowers. It will make her feel better. And stay away from spider mounds. Kilty didn't want to leave. Go now, Kilty commanded Kirian. Kilty scurried off as fast as she could with her injured leg. Kirian turned back to Kirsha. She was still frantically pulling against him. Tell me, or do I have to take my belt to you like a child? I was, I was, started Kirsha. Her body shook and convulsed as her words spurted out of her. She yanked hard against his grip. Let me go. No, you will tell me, and you will tell me now stated Kirian firmly. He added, Tell me before Kilty returns. He pulled her back close and again wrapped his arms around her. I was b b beaten. Her, her breasts came in jerks. She tried to calm down, but she shook all the more. S -s Several t -t times my p -p -p parents, parents s -s said that, that 
I, I, I was, her, her shaking increased. I was uh, ugly, not beautiful. They, they didn't want to, want to even look at me, me because, because I was, I was so ugly. Kirian felt anger rise within him. He was also very concerned for Kirsha. He didn't know how to get her to stop shaking. He kept his arms around her protectively, and he squeezed her tightly. He kissed the top of her head. Your parents were wrong, Kirian stated. No one could ever take away your beauty. Kirian paused. Did, did anything else happen? No, 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 no she said jerkily. The, the, thank the, 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 the awesome, the, the, was it? The, the, that was enough. Kirian petted her. Oh, Kirsha, I love you. I would never hurt you that way. I would never hit you, even when we're married. I, I, I don't, don't, well, 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 want to, to, to get married, she spurted out. Then, I will ask you every day, stated Kirian. I'll ask you until you say yes. Kirian held her tightly until she stopped shaking. Kilty came back. She sat near the wagon and waited quietly. She did make sure not to sit near a spider mound. After some time, Kirsha stopped pushing against Kirian. She gripped his shirt tightly in her hands as her tears soaked the front of his shirt. Kirian relaxed his hold on her. He lifted her chin and wiped away the rest of her tears. Are you ready to keep going? She nodded her head yes. They again started walking. Kirian thought of Kirsha's experience. He knew that she had lost her parents as he had. He had thought the reason for her not talking about her past was because of the painful loss of her parents. But this was never one of his thoughts about her. He never realized how truly fragile she was. She seemed so confident and reliable. He wondered how old Kirsha had been when whosoever beat her, and he wondered how badly. He hadn't noticed scars when he was getting the spiders off her, but he hadn't noticed anything but the spiders. They walked along deep in thought. The heat of the sun was almost unnoticed by them. And they didn't stop for lunch, like the other days of their travel. They just nibbled and walked. By mid-afternoon, the coastline curved northeast, so they headed due east. Kirsha felt confident that they could find the cave. For the time being, she forgot her past and tried to spread out like the wind to feel what they might not see. Kirsha did this subconsciously. In the early evening, they stopped for the night. They were tired from walking until midnight yesterday and then starting so early this morning. Kilty got what she needed to change her bandage and got out her blanket. She spread out her blanket without Kirsha saying a word. Her leg felt extra stiff this evening, so she was anxious to get the new herbs on it, but she didn't want Kirsha to know. Kirian wanted to know more about what had happened to Kirsha, but he didn't know how to reapproach the subject. So he went about building them a fire. Even though Kirsha was tired, she just paced back and forth. When Kirian finished the fire, he sat back on his heels. He watched Kirsha. He glanced to Kilty and got an idea. He jumped up and rushed at Kirsha. When he got to her, he threw his arm around her waist, picked her up, and spun her around. Kirsha screamed. She was extremely startled. Kirian, stop it! What are you doing? She tried to push his arm down off her waist. Let me go! Please, let me go! Kirian whispered in her ear. Kirsha, I'm just playing with you. I'm not going to hurt you. You're trapping me! Kirian released her and tapped her leg with his hand. Tag, you're it! Kirian dashed off. Kirsha rotated around and watched him. Kirian turned back. Come on and catch me. I can't catch you, stated Kirsha. You can't count either, but that doesn't stop you from trying. Kirsha put her hands on her hips. I can count. Kirsha can't count, sung Kirian. Kirsha can't count. 
You better catch him, stated Kilty. You can't get you can't let him get away with singing that. Kirsha gave Kilty a reluctant half smile. She gathered up her skirt and chased Kirian. Kirian ran backwards and he would spin out of reach when Kirsha got close. Kilty enjoyed watching them. She sat watching as the herbal cream soaked into her womb. Finally, Kirsha came to a knee-high stone. She leapt upon the stone and leapt towards Kirian. Her hand landed on Kirian's back as she pushed him several steps. There, I got you. I can count. Kirian smiled and turned to face her. Now I'm it. I'm going to get you. Kirsha dropped her draw. What? Kirian motioned with his hand. You better run. Kirsha turned and ran. No, Kirian. I didn't say anything about you. Kirsha tripped on her dress and fell forward. She scrambled up and leapt over the fire. She stopped to catch her breath. She turned to see where Kirian was as he tackled her to the ground. I got you, said Kirian as he smiled broadly. Kirian, let me up. You're too heavy. You're squishing me. Kirian leaned down and kissed her on the mouth. Kirsha tried turning away. Kirian, stop. Let me up. Am I hurting you? asked Kirian. A kiss is not the same as a beating. Kirian, how many times did whosoever beat you? Who beat you? asked Kirian. He got up off Kirsha and let her up. Did your parents beat you? What were you beaten with? Fist? A belt? What? Tears flooded down Kirsha's face. No, my parents didn't beat me. They couldn't stand to even look at me. She said as she sat up. She dropped her head to her hands. Kirian gently lifted her chin. I know it's painful for you to talk about, but I want you to try. Why? So you can laugh at me? Weak little Kirsha? I'm not weak, and I don't need anybody. I don't need you, and I don't need Kilty. No, Kirsha. I don't want to laugh at you, said Kirian solemnly. I don't consider you weak. Kirian paused. And you may not need us, but we, Kirian motioned towards Kilty, we need you. Kilty and I need you. No, you don't. Nobody needs me. I'm too ugly. My parents didn't even want me. I heard them talking to Mr. Volens. They told him they wished they had never agreed to take me. I learned a lot by eavesdropping. I learned that my real parents gave me to Mr. Volens for him to find me a home. But then, when my adopting parents wanted to give me back to my real parents, Mr. Volens told him it was too late. My parents had already gone to some place. I don't remember the name exactly, but it ended with rarius or rarium. I think it was another word for death. So my parents didn't want me, and neither did my adopting parents. I asked Mr. Volens if, he, if I could live with him. He said no. He said I would better understand why later. Well, later came. My parents died, and the first thing Mr. Volens did was ship me off. He didn't want me either, only he couldn't say that to my face. Maybe I was better off with him not telling me, but I never would have believed that until I heard you tell Kilty you don't want her. What? asked Kirian. I didn't say I didn't want Kilty. I said I didn't want her to call me dad. I said I didn't want the village to think she was mine. But you agreed to take her stated Kirsha fiercely. I was there. I heard you. But you don't want Kilty, especially when she gets, when she hurts herself. Kirian sighed. He looked over to Kilty. I never meant things to sound that way. I want Kilty. I want her with us always. It's just, it's just, I don't like the village thinking that we don't take proper care of her. Here we go with the village again, stated Kirsha, exasperated. For the life of me, I don't know why you're so bent on express, ex impressing the village. I hate the village. There is no way in this life to ever impress the village. The village doesn't like it when we keep Kilty indoors until I let her go out to play and she hurts herself. I'll tell you, not one child who ever played didn't come home with a bruise. When children pr play precariously, they hurt themselves. You can't have things both ways, but the village complains either way. You cannot ever please or impress the village, ever. 
They are a sorry lot of hypocrites. Kirian stared at Kirsha a few minutes. He glanced at Kilthy again. He turned back to Kirsha and said, You are right. I, I never thought about the conflicting criticisms before. Well then, answer the question for yourself. Do we or do we not take proper care of Kilty? Do we feed her? Do we see that she takes a bath after playing? When she gets hurt, do we bring her to Dr. Highhands? And while we're on him, I'll point out that is why Dr. Highhands is there. To help those who hurt themselves or have something hurt them, whether they be children or adults, whether it's from playing or working. Kirsha paused. She motioned to Kilty. Look at her. Kirian looked at Kilty. When she came to us, she was sickly and overly thin. She's still small, but she's grown a lot. She has at least some meat on her bones now. And she has color. She has rosy cheeks, glistening eyes. She isn't pale white anymore. She came to us in rags. Now she has pretty dresses and nice boots. She has a bonnet for when it's hot and a coat for when it's cold. How can anyone legitimately say that Kilty doesn't have proper care? Kirian turned back to Kirsha and smiled at her. You're absolutely right. Oh, Kirsha, I love you so much. Kirsha turned her gaze down. Kirian gently lifted her chin. Hey, you're pretty and I love you. I want you no matter what. Kirsha slipped her hand in his and pushed his hand down off her chin. We need to go to sleep, she said. Yes, dear. Just let me get my blanket so I can sleep next to you. No, Kirian, pleaded Kirsha. I'm not going to beat you, but I'm going to make a happy home for my daughter, Kilty. Kirsha glanced at Kilty. Kilty didn't know if she should smile or not. Well, at least check Kilty's wound first, relented Kirsha. She changed her bandage by herself. You need to make sure she did it right. Kirian did. Kilty had done a good job. If Kilty, if Kirian hadn't known otherwise, he would have thought that Kirsha had applied the herbal cream, cream and had rewrapped Kilty's wound. Kirian spread his blanket next to Kirsha and snuggled up to her. Kir Kirsha leaned back slightly. Do you have to be so close? She asked. Yes, replied Kirian. I can't breathe. You can breathe just fine, stated Kirian, and I'm not suffocating you. Just relax and go to sleep. Kirsha sighed, but she was tired and she soon faded off to sleep. I see you're watching the children again, stated Arisha to her husband. Yes, well, it seems that Kirsha is as stubborn as her mother, teased Arik. What? I'm not stubborn, Arik chuckled. So you just accepted me and our relationship the first time I told you that I loved you, or the first time I kissed you. Kirian kissed Kish Kirsha, exclaimed Arisha, disbelieving. Yes, right on the mouth, replied Arik, smiling. First, he played a short game of tag with her and tackled her to the ground. Arisha opened her mouth, but at first no words would come out. Really? she asked finally. Would I lie to my beautiful wife? No, but but Kirian has never been that aggressive. Kirian loves Kirsha very deeply, like I love you. And earlier, Kirsha told Kirian about Dante beating her, although she didn't name Dante. Arisha felt weak in the knees, and so she started to sit. Arik quickly caught her up and guided her to the edge of the bed. This, this is incredible. This is more than we could hope for. Arik handed Arisha her green orb. As the orb touched her hands, it lit up. They still have a long way to go, dear. Yes, I know, replied Arisha, as she looked into the illuminated orb at her children. Kilty changed her bandage all by herself, Arik added. She has changed it before on her own, stated Arisha, as she looked at Arik. Does... Does, well, perhaps I shouldn't ask. She glanced down into her orb again. But I must know, 
does Kirsha know? Does Kirsha know? Eric smiled at his wife. He gently stroked her cheek. Yes, dear, she knows. She complained of not being able to breathe, but she knows. Arik paused. Arik rose off the bed and took a few steps. He kept his back to his wife. What is it, dear? Arisha asked anxiously. Arik could not face his wife. His heart was heavy and his tears flowed freely down his face. Arisha got up off the bed and gently laid her hand on Arik's shoulder. What is it, Arik? Please tell me. Kirsha. Kirsha knows something else. Kirsha knows. Knows what? Arisha turned her husband towards her. I knew you were crying. What does Kirsha know? What knowledge could be so awful? She knows that we gave her up. She thinks we didn't want her. What? gasped Arisha. She again grew weak in the knees. Arik again guided her to the bed. She overheard the Ballhausers tell Mr. Volans that they didn't want her. They apparently asked for him to return her to us, but we had already come here to the altararium. Tears ran down Arisha's face. Arik pulled his wife up and pulled her close. He stroked her hair. I knew the Ballhausers did nothing to comfort Kirsha from the beatings and they did nothing to prevent them. I knew they told Kirsha she was ugly, something I couldn't imagine since Kirsha is so beautiful, but... Arisha looked up at her husband. But this is far worse. No wonder Kirsha is so reclusive. With this news, I think that even if she is able to find the orb, Kirsha may not listen to us. Ark wiped away his wife's tears. Kirsha is reclusive also, partly, because she has no use for the hypocrisy of the village. Come, let's get some rest. They both set their orbs, orbs on their pillows, small pillows, on their dressing tables. As they did so, the glow from their orbs dissipated. Then they went to bed. Okay, writers, that's the end of chapter six. I hope you enjoyed this chapter. If you're like me, you want us to keep reading, but we don't want the videos too long, and I'm sure this is our longest one so far. But we got in some of Kirsha's history. A character's history is important because it affects how they act and react. I'm sure we were wondering why Kirsha was so pushing, carrying away, and now we have a little bit of a, of a clue. And sometimes even the story won't reveal everything. Like, you don't know everything about Kirsha's past yet. You, as the writer, need to, to know your character's history, written and unwritten. Sometimes as you write, the history will come to you. As you ask yourself questions about the story, you ask yourself, why is Kirsha doing this? And then the answer just pops in your head, and you answer these questions. Some of your answers for your story will be history like this. If you are enjoying this journey, then don't forget to hit the like and subscribe and ring the bell so we can continue to write together. Join me on Tuesday for Emotions. And then next Friday, we will read Chapter 7, The Cave. If you're doing the chapter exchange, then send me the PDF or Word document version of your chapter to writewithmichaela at gmail.com. That's W-R-I-T-E-W-I-T-H. M-Y-K-E-L-A at gmail.com. Remember the permission I discussed at the beginning of today. I look forward to reading your stories and I hope to read some of them on my channel. I can't wait until you can visit my website at www.bymichaela.com and read some character bios. Uh, still waiting on the professionals to finish. Leave a comment below. Uh, if you know your character's history if you've been you started writing you're only in chapter six or so or seven and you already know the history of one or more of your characters you know what happened to them to get them to the point of the story starting you know when when your story starts sometimes just something opens up and you just start writing. And so like when we had the plot, you have three friends and one friend gets hurt. So you could have just started writing. So you may not have known the histories, but at this point, 
Do you know your character's history? Did you know it before you decided on the three friends? Leave the comment below. Thank you for joining me today. I appreciate your participation. If you know someone who would like this video, then please share it with them. This is McKella with Ride with McKella. Bye for now.